We're all sitting in the same room, but each of us is in a different world. We're trying to make the world of concentration in which you're fully aware of your body as you feel it from within. You're trying to make that the center of your attention. And that's the center of your desire right now, to get the mind to stay here. The problem is the mind has lots of other worlds at its disposal because it has lots of other desires. This is a process that the Buddha calls becoming, where based on a particular desire you take on a particular identity around that desire, and then there's a relevant world around that desire as well. They all go together. And the fact that we have so many different worlds and different desires can work against us. Like right now, the desire for thinking about tomorrow's meal or tomorrow's activities comes up that can eat away at your world of concentration. Or if your memory of something that somebody close to you did recently suddenly overcomes the mind. Or if sleepiness or any of the hindrances, they'll eat away at the world of concentration and replace it with a different one. So that's something you have to fight for the time being. But the fact that you have so many different worlds can also work to your advantage when you learn how to move smoothly through them, choosing your worlds instead of just being subject to whatever comes by. That's a skill. and your ability to shift from one frame of reference to another frame of reference is going to come in handy. So the part of the mind that can watch the process is an important part of the meditation. Because when you get into concentration, you should have a sense that nothing in the world matters. Nothing in the world outside right now matters. All that matters is your ability to stay with the breath. And any thinking that's related to the world outside, you want to put that aside. And any ways of thinking related to the world outside, put those aside as well. We carry lots of assumptions into the meditation about who we are, what we're doing here, why we're here. And those assumptions are good for getting us here, but once you're here, you don't need them anymore. Take the simple assumption that you're facing forward, okay, your eyes are facing forward right now. What direction is your mind facing? The mind doesn't have a direction. When you're dealing with a body, it takes on the directions re related to the body. But as for its awareness right here in the present moment, centered on the breath, you don't need to have a sense of what's in front and what's in back. They all should be the same. And any other really basic perceptions that we tend to hold on to. You want to learn how to put them aside when you need to put them aside, then take them back on again when you need to. The skill here is having that part back in the mind that can look in the different worlds that you have at your disposal and see when you have to take on the assumptions and when you don't. The Johns and Thailand talk about this quite a lot. Letting go of convention, they say. You use conventions for when they're useful, and then you put them aside. Like right now, your name is irrelevant. Your gender is irrelevant. All kinds of things that are related to the world outside, those are irrelevant. They're conventions that are useful in certain worlds, but not in the world of your concentration. Even the Buddha's analysis of what's going on here in terms of fabrication, becoming. These are conventions, too. There's only one thing that's not a convention, and that's release. So we're moving from one set of conventions to another, to another. But it's good while you're here to try to let go of all the conventions that are not related to the breath right now. Be as thoroughgoing as you can. 
because your ability to step outside of those conventions allows you to look back at them when you return with a different perspective. And your ability to step out allows you to play with those conventions a lot more skillfully. I think I've told you about that dream I had about a John Fuhrman when I first went to stay with him. He had a closet. He walked in the closet, came out wearing one hat, he had a cowboy hat. And then he walked in, came out, and had another hat. I forget how many different kinds of hats, but he kept going in the closet and coming out wearing a different hat. And I looked in the closet, and sure enough, it was filled with hats. And the next day I got to see him wearing different hats. I was, I was there for, for a gatin, my very first gatin. And all of a sudden he was a carpenter. They're putting together bamboo sheds. Instead of having tents that you could put up like we put up tents here, they would put bamboo up in a frame and then you'd cover it with leaves. And that would be your, your booth. And so he was in charge of the construction of those. He had other hats as well, from whom I learned how to do kaolam, which is a suite in Thailand, where you take bamboo sections and you stuff it with sticky rice and sugar and coconut milk and black beans, and then you grill it over charcoal. His skill was knowing how to grill it over charcoal. I learned that from him. Of course, what it meant was when the kaolam was made, I never got to eat it because I'd help fix it. I learned lots of different skills from him, but he was very good at taking off hats and putting hats back on again. He could be very quick about changing his role in any situation, because he was good at stepping out of roles. And the ability to step out of roles allows you to see what the conventions are, when they're useful to hold on to and when you can put them aside. Now, there are problems when you get into concentration and you don't want to leave because things outside and the other worlds that you're experiencing right now are so unpleasant. That's when concentration becomes a problem. But if you can learn how to face up to unpleasantness and not take it quite so seriously, then you can switch back and forth. And you're in a better position to see when something is skillful and when it's not. The things may be true for one particular world, but you don't, have to, you don't have to carry that truth around with you all the time. You can let it go while you're here, and then you pick it back up again. This is why the Buddha said in terms of his speech, he would say things that were only true and beneficial and timely right for that particular desire, right for that particular world, at that particular time. That principle applies not only to speech, but also to your thoughts inside. When it's useful to hold on to a particular truth and when you put it aside. You learn this by stepping back from these things. And looking at them from the outside, which is why when you're practicing concentration, when especially at the very beginning, when thoughts come up, the first rule of thumb is you don't go with them, no matter how fascinating they are, no matter how important they are, no matter how true they may seem. You've got to learn how to step out of that truth. And this is a useful skill not only at the very beginning, but you want to learn it because it is so opposite to the mind's knee-jerk reaction. An idea comes up and you latch onto it. A truth comes up and you latch onto it even more firmly. That may be true for some things, but not necessarily for others. But if you hold onto it, this has got to be true all the way across the board. You're going to get into trouble. So you have to learn how to step back from all your beliefs. Anything that would pull you out of the concentration, now you get to drop it. No matter how true it may be, it's not true for your concentration. It's not beneficial, it's not timely. That when, when the time comes to 
wear those truths again, the same way you'd wear a suit of clothes. You can wear them with a sense of ease, not feel like you're bound by a straitjacket. It's when anything comes up in the meditation, step back. This ability to step back will be especially important as insights start arising. Because sometimes you have an insight that seems psychologically important, and you'll latch on to it. But well, maybe it's not true all the way across the board. And John Lee's good rule of thumb is when something comes up, you ask yourself, what if, to what extent is the opposite true? That's one way of stepping back. Ubasaka Gi would say, when something comes up, see what your mind does the immediately, the moment after it comes up. See what defilement rushes in to lay claim to it. In other words, you step back, step back. Some of the worst insights are the ones that fit in with your idea of what you read in books. But what kind of insights you're supposed to have? One of the worst things I've seen recently is someone saying that stream entry is when you realize there is no self. That's a bad case of what they call the corruptions of insight. But because you've read it in books, it's very easy to hold on to it. So whatever realizations come up, you have to ask yourself, to what extent is it true? To what extent is it useful? And to what extent is it not? And this is, is this the right time for that? So the ability to step out of different worlds is a really useful one. Because your ability to step out of the world of California on the first day of January 2018 will help you get into concentration. Your ability to get step out of your world of your identity, who you are, will help you get into concentration. And help save you from all kinds of unskillful attachments. Laying hold of things, but at the time when they're not useful and when they're not timely. This ability to step back is your safeguard. So keep practicing at it until you get good at it, because that'll enable you to use conventions when they're useful, and put them aside easily when they're not. And in mastering that skill, you get closer and closer to the release that is beyond conventions. Which is where all this is aimed. The Buddha said that's the, the essence of everything that we're doing. It's the taste of everything we're doing. The, in other words, the real pleasure that you get out of it comes when you get that sense of freedom. So any thoughts that come up that are not related to being with the breath? Are being simply awareness with breath. Learn how to put them aside. And you'll find as you put them aside that a lot of your assumptions start coming up and you put them aside as well. Things you never really thought you'd thought, but you actually were thinking or felt, but you actually are, are feeling. This is one of the ways in which a lot of un, unconscious stuff gets dug up. It's not just phobias and other psychological problems, things that you, in your normal everyday life, hold on to and say, this is really true. And it's useful to hold on to. It's not unhealthy when you're dealing with things outside. But in terms of the concentration, you've got to let it go. The thing with conventions as a kind of game, like language is a game. The game you play for a serious purpose, but there are times when you step out of the game. 
And now we're playing the game of concentration. So pay attention only to the things that are really relevant to this game. And digging out all the irrelevant things would be very revealing. And will enable you to step back into those conventions when you need to with a lot more skill.